Hi everyone, this is Dr. Cooley. I'm one of the cardiac surgeons here at UT Health in Tyler. And today we're gonna to talk about atrial fibrillation because September is atrial fibrillation month nationally. So AFib has become a really big problem for um, what we see in, in heart patients. So we wanna answer some questions today and give you some insight into what AFib is and what we can do to help you with it. The first question is, what is AFib and what causes it? AFib is a problem with the conduction system of the heart, and that's a fancy way of saying your heart's own pacemaker, so your heart's electrical system. So normally when your heart beats, it has that bump, 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 bump sound to your heartbeat, and that is the top chamber of your heart is the first sound, and that's your atrium. So the atrium is the filling chamber, and then it squeezes with that first sound and then goes to the squeezing chamber of your heart that pumps blood out to your body. Normally, that's all coordinated with your heart's natural pacemaker, bump, 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 bump. When we have AFib, there's some of the cells in that atrium have gone bad, and they like to generate their own little electrical impulses like a strobe light to make their own signals that aren't supposed to be there. So when that happens, instead of having a nice coordinated squeeze of the atrium, it just wiggles instead, which is not very efficient for your heart and can cause some problems. So what are the symptoms of AFib? So there's some typical symptoms of AFib. The most common one has to do with that wiggling and an irregular heartbeat, which a lot of people can feel, especially when it starts going really fast. So you can have palpitations, the feeling of a skipped heartbeat, or feel like you have a racing heart. Sometimes people feel short of breath because it's not a very efficient way to pump. And then also they can feel a little lightheaded or dizzy if their blood pressure drops. It's important to know also though that sometimes people, actually about 15 to 20 percent, don't feel any symptoms at all. And that actually can be one of the more dangerous types because we don't necessarily know it's there. So do patients with AFib often have other heart-related issues? It's very common. AFib in general is very common, but you're at a higher risk for it if you already have heart trouble like coronary disease, heart failure, valves that leak. Um, but other medical problems that are very typical in the United States based on our American lifestyle also put you at a high risk for AFib. So smoking, COPD, um, sleep apnea, and those things like that, diabetes, obesity, that all really raises the chance that you could have AFib. It's very common to the, to the point now that people 65 or older, about one out of 10 people has it. What are the dangers of living with AFib? So there are a few things we look at, and the one we typically see, and you always hear on TV, you know, with all the commercials for medicine for AFib, they're not talking about heart rates and racing hearts, they're talking about strokes. So the problem, the biggest problem with AFib is that it can cause clots to form inside your heart. When your heart's squeezing well, blood's moving very quickly through the heart, but if it's just sitting there wiggling, the, the, heart, the blood can kind of sit and stagnate a little bit and then form a clot. If that clot breaks free, that's how you can get a stroke. So AFib is actually responsible for about 20% of strokes in the United States each year. So that's what we typically see as the biggest complication, but AFib also can have a higher rate of heart failure, meaning the heart muscle gets tired and weak, so you have problems with your breathing and swelling and fluid retention. It can cause your valves to start leaking, which again can lead into that heart failure itself. And it can also increase your risk of having problems like heart attacks as well. Are there any non-surgical treatments for AFib? Mm -hmm. There are. Actually, the main treatment for AFib is not surgery. So because it's so common, um, we have a lot, a lot of different medical options. So there's really three things we look at with the medical side on giving you, giving you medications and prescriptions. So one, we give you medicines to try to slow down your heart rate. That doesn't necessarily get rid of that risk of having the clots form and advancing to heart failure, but it helps with those symptoms because typically you don't feel those bad symptoms if your heart is going at normal rate, even if it's irregular. The next type of medicine we give is a different type that tries to snap you back into a normal heart rate. Um, and so that can hopefully get it so your heart's beating more efficiently. And then the third is the blood thinner to try to prevent any blood clots that form. 
Other things that you may hear about is people getting their heart shocked back into rhythm. So the heart's kind of like an alarm clock. If it's blinking and misbehaving, if you unplug it and plug it back in, it'll reset. And that's kind of what that electrical cardio version is for, which is the things that we try leading up to a procedure. So what are the surgical options? So there are a few. There are a few surgical options, and we reserve those for people who um, really haven't been able to get their symptoms under control using the medical options. So the first one is actually with a colleague of mine on the cardiology side called an electrophysiologist, and they can do something that's called a, a catheter ablation. So they basically put a big IV in your, in your groin, and they go up into your heart and they try to freeze the areas that are causing the AFib. So that is great for people who haven't had it for years and years and years. So they've had it for a short amount of time and it's the type that kind of comes and goes on its own. So they have wonderful success with that. For the people who are what we call refractory, either, either they failed that as well, or they've had it for a long time, or they're in it all the time. It doesn't come and go. We have some different surgeries and actually a very exciting new surgery here at UT Health where it's a staged procedure. It's called the convergent surgery. And that's where I, as the heart surgeon, can go in with a little incision just underneath the breastbone. I can go on the back of the heart where all of those signals are coming from in the atrium, and I can apply heat, basically burn them like you're burning a wart, and turn that whole area to scar so it basically neutralizes those signals. And then after you recover from that, then the EP side will go in and do their catheter ablation to finish off the surgery. Um, the other thing we do along with that is do a little procedure on the back of the heart to block off the area where those clots can usually form. How do you determine which treatment option is right for each patient? So there's, we like to treat each patient as a custom of what's best for you. Um, a lot of it has to do with symptoms. So if you're on your medications and you are still in AFib, but you feel fine and it's not causing you any symptom problems day to day, then we would say, you know, we're doing a good job, let's stay with that. If it's getting to the point though, where you're having that shortness of breath, you're having palpitations, you're having trouble with your blood pressure, or you're starting to see some of those complications, like your heart's getting weaker, that's when we talk about being more aggressive. And then we do some fancy tests with echocardiograms and different measurements to see what treatment option would be best. Would we try just the catheter ablation or would we move on to try the convergent procedure for you? What is recovery like for the surgical procedures? So for the convergent procedure, it's actually about two days where you're in the hospital. The incision's quite small, it's about this big. Um, we don't have to go on the heart-lung machine. I don't have to go through the breastbone or anything like that. So it's a pretty quick recovery um, from a heart surgery standpoint. Uh, usually for a couple weeks, you would end up just kind of taking it easy, not lifting anything heavy. Um, and then about six weeks later, you go in and have the other part of the procedure done with the cardiologist. And that's a same day surgery where the next day you would be back to, back to full steam after that. So are these procedures a cure for AFib or are there still going to be long-term side effects? So AFib can be very, very tricky. So that's why we have all of these different options and actually technology is really, really booming and research is really pouring into AFib right now. So the, the goal of treatment right now is to decrease your symptoms and decrease your risks associated with AFib. So that's what we hope the surgery will do. So when you are one of the patients that qualifies for the convergent procedure, meaning we've tried everything else and we're, it hasn't worked, so we know you have a real tricky case of AFib, um, we actually have about 70 to 80% success rate, um, sometimes up to 85% success, depending on which medicines you're on, of getting you out of it and not feeling it where it's, it's bothering you day to day. Um, overall, looking to in the future, all of the studies are looking to see how we can try to completely get rid of it. A lot of those patients will have it completely gone, but our goal of treatment is just to at least get it to where the risk and the symptoms and how you're feeling really are decreased. So what is your overall goal for your patients? So my overall goal really for any of my patients um, with heart surgery is to give you as many good days as God has planned for you. So I want you to be able to have a lot of healthy days where you're feeling good and getting back to just being you. 
Um, I think you know, a lot of these things really mess with quality of life and AFib is one of those where if you have a bad case of it, you feel rotten, you can't do your normal things. Um, you know, you never really know when it's gonna hit and it's hard to plan around. Some of the medicines sometimes, just like any medicine, can have some side effects that aren't making you feel too good. So the goal with all of this is to make you feel good and have the decrease in those complication risks, which will give you a lot of healthy days. Okay, that's all we have. So if you all have any questions that we haven't covered, um, feel free to post them in the comments and our, our team will keep tabs on those and we'll try to get some answers back to you. So have a good day.